And why is it that I'm the only one that's speaking up about that on county council? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If it was a young black man mm -hmm. who did something in the community, mm -hmm. they would release the tape. Right even away. if they were criminally charging him for something. But let me carry one step further. Let a black officer there you go. pull a white girl by the handcuffs and, and, and pull her by her hair, pull her 50 feet. Mm -hmm. You'd have got tired of looking at it by now. Dr. Curry. This is Kobe Owens. Jay Street. And welcome to The Source. Well, today is going to be an interesting show, and I hope that you will really get your popcorn and listen to a lot that we have to say because we have a full packed hour, and I want to make sure that we really get to all the news. The first thing I want to do today is I want these two gentlemen who are sitting to my right and to my left to explain to me or share with me what's up with the Delaware Black Caucus, the group that's supposed to be representing us and making sure the black agenda is being, moving forward. What's up with it? So first off, I just want to point out the difference of black caucuses. Okay. There used to be one black caucus that consisted of all black elected officials. Now what we're talking about is the legislative, Delaware Legislative Black Caucus, which is the caucus of members of the General Assembly. So they have to be state reps or state senators to be in the Legislative Black Caucus. All right, now, before you go any further, mm -hmm. because my viewers want to know facts, you said at one point it was one. Yes. Why did it become two? So once um, there was enough members elected down to the General Assembly, they felt the need um, to form one to work on a black agenda, work on legislation Oh, together to work on a black a agenda. Yes. That's where I was going. I want to make sure. All right, so I'm, I'm going to keep cutting you off because I'm sitting here upset today. Mm -hmm. You have told me so far, we've split, we got one who are just dealing with the legislature. Tell me the difference in the two again. Yeah, so again, the Delaware Legislative Black Caucus mm -hmm. is the group of black legislators elected to the state senate, state house. So mm -hmm. three um, in the state senate and nine in the state house that come together under the leadership of uh, uh, state representative Kendra Johnson right now. She's the chair. Um, and they're supposed to work on a black agenda. So their Justice for All agenda, which they rolled out in June of 2020, um, they've kind of just been adding to that ever since. You've had two task force come out of it. So one task force was the law enforcement uh, task force, law enforcement reform task force, and the other was the African American task force, which focuses on health, education, environment, um, um, economic opportunity and criminal justice. Well, I've been hearing a whole lot of stuff going on with criminal justice. I've been hearing a lot of stuff going on with police reform. I've been hearing a whole lot of stuff going on with the educational system, and I have not heard voices from the black community. What are they doing? Yeah, so, I mean, you have individuals who are working on um, various pieces of legislation. I think last year, um, one of the stars of the General Assembly altogether was uh, Representative Sherry Dorsey Walker. She had one of the um, mm -hmm. highest numbers of bills passed. I saw that. Um, and most of her bills had to speak to the African-American community. Um, so whether it had to do with policing reform, black history, education, um, she was kind of leading the, the force there. She also was the prime sponsor. Sponsor, um, the prime house sponsor of making Juneteenth a permanent paid holiday. For I us. had an opportunity and next week on on the. Uh, I'm coming to you in a minute, uh, Brother Street. But on 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 Coffee with Curry, I had an opportunity, and it'll be next week. We're going to be sharing. A matter of fact, it's this week. Uh, we'll be sharing with um, Sherry, uh, and she did do a whole lot. And every, I told her her whole agenda spoke to the black agenda. Yes. She's one of how many again? There's 12 total. 12 total. I would like to make sure that everybody see these names of the individuals. We won't name them right now. We're showing them. Mm -hmm. We want them to see the names. We're going to eventually show you the pictures. And we might be showing you the pictures depending on how good the, the staff is going to get this together. Because I want you to see who are the people you are elected. 
Because what I'm, what I'm reason why I'm coming today with such um, <laughs> being antsy is because I am sick and tired of interviewing first black mayor of the city, first black state representative, first, 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 who did amazing things. Now, all of a sudden, with this cancel culture, with this personal agendas, the white agenda who really overshadows the black agenda, what we're getting is a bunch of people who have black skin but are not a part of the black community. Because I attend E. Zion Fair Baptist Church, it does not make me a Christian. It's what I do that makes me a Christian. And today I asked him and immediately I jumped to it and he said it was two, it was one. Now they moved to two. Now, after you get past the legislators and all that, what's the other group? So there is another group and it was all the black legislators at a time. Um, now, that group is no longer around. Um, and since then, we formed the Delaware Democratic Party Black Caucus, which is to engage black stakeholders in communities all across the state. Um, we have over 200 members, um, and it's from Georgetown, Seaford, Middletown, uh, Dover to Wilmington. Mm -hmm. um, and that is about voter education, voter registration, and voter um, mobilization. Mm -hmm. But most of them are not elected. None of them are And elected. the reason why I say that before, you know, Jake, because he's nervous over there. The reason why I'm saying that is because it's one thing for those of us like myself who's a minister who can certainly speak out. Right. But when you have the power, you're elected to represent mm -hmm. is where I want to stay. Right. And you're saying... Why, Jay, why aren't you in the, um, I guess because you're county? Why, why aren't you a part of the black, uh, black Caucus? The fact of the matter is, I was chair of the Delaware Black Caucus for about four years. And it was statewide. It did include all the black elected officials. And regrettably, I was just too aggressive. Uh, for some of the other elected officials. Mm. Um, because I was running the Black Caucus like the NAACP. Okay. I was straightforward. We addressed issues. <coughs> we did fundraising. We, matter of fact, we had a... Uh, <coughs> when the uh, situation in Haiti happened, uh, we raised over $30,000, sent that money to the Clinton Foundation and other places, supporting the... Uh, <coughs> the uh, situation in, in Haiti at the time. Um, but I was aggressive, straightforward on TV um, in addressing issues like we're addressing now. I was too aggressive for some people, one, and two, um, even though I was chair of the Black Caucus, I, the caucus wasn't getting the respect that I thought it should have uh, from people like the governor at the time mm -hmm. because I had no vote in the General Assembly, so he wasn't paying me no ragtag mind. Yeah. Um, and I felt very strongly that whoever the chairperson was should be a member of the General Assembly. Um, and so after uh, my tenure was over, um, Hanifa took it over, and she became chairperson. And a little while after that, she and, uh, at, at the time, Charles Potter, became co-chairs, and there was one meeting we had right after uh, Congresswoman Blunt got elected, and that had to do with uh, the situation at, at Salazie Annum School where the city was going to, at the time, considering uh, giving Boehner Stadium to Salazie Annum, and, and that was opposed um, by at least one member of the caucus. And we had that meeting. Never had a meeting since then. Wow. <laughs> but we, the, the harsh fact of the matter is, it was too many people that didn't get along. It didn't work. And um, but you are the, the point. The, but to get the, along. The, the, the point where at the point where I was too aggressive um, for a lot of people, too straightforward, staying on the battlefield, and and. As some people said at the time, didn't anybody know it was a black caucus uh, until I became chairperson. Um, but we just didn't get along. I mean, there are situations where people like to got fighting. Um, that's how bad it was. And um, I didn't feel as though because I had made crystal clear that I thought 
the chairperson should be a member of the General Assembly. Um, so it fell apart. You know, but, you know, we, we elect people not so y'all could become personal and intimate friends. We elect people so that the black agenda can be pushed. Not only pushed, but solved. It troubles me, and the reason why we're bringing this up before we get into all the news of today is because right now, everything we're going to discuss, the next four or five topics, is a result of the decay in the black community leadership. I'm a preacher. I used to be very active with IMAC. But whenever we get into the personality conflicts, we never can solve a problem. That is a trick of the enemy to keep us divided. Now, I understand the governor. Why should he care about the black caucus if the people who he need to get his legislation through is not running it, not speaking out against anything? But that's the problem. That's the problem. Our community is divided. I, I have people who I consider to be friends, some state representatives. This whole Leobor, this whole policing stuff, it has to get off the desk and it has to get in front of everyone because what's going to happen is since we're starting to get our viewership up, it's time to call people out so that blacks can start voting for people who are about the black agenda. Well, and, and, and I, I just want to reiterate, I mean, I was just, I mean, literally, as in my capacity as chair of the Black Caucus, we marched on the former superintendent of, of the Christina School District, and we, we left the Christina School District office and went straight to the governor's office as relates to education, education funding, which uh, some eight, nine years later, after fighting continually, I ended up having to form a new organization and, and finally sue the state um, to get what's going to be a $100 million a year every year for low income, at risk, um, and, and special needs children. But isn't that what we're supposed to be doing? Well, everybody didn't agree with it at the time. Well, and, but the problem is, we, what we, I hope that this vehicle begin to pull out and show people who people are. Well, the, the fact of the matter is, I sat here quiet for the beginning of the show, because it's embarrassing to me. The state of Delaware is one of the few states that's not the only state. Right that doesn't have an active statewide yes, right. black caucus. Absolutely. And I was to the point, okay, so we don't agree on everything. At least sponsor scholarships. Yeah. At least do something to say that we're together doing something and we're doing something to make a difference. The things that we can't agree on, let's just proceed with. Um, but I didn't do well with that. Um, and so I, I feel like part of it's my fault. I also feel like it got to the point where there wasn't anything that I could do about it. But I also, now that you've raised it, there's good reason to be optimistic about a potential Delaware Black Caucus because there are new players all over the place. Yeah, but we got some new players, but we got some old players who are, who are still messing up. But I believe, you know, one of the things that we stopped, mm -hmm. McGee, a good example, we stopped the silent storm. Now, I was doing some research because we're never going to give you information that is not r legit. And as I was doing my research on the quiet storm, we had the mayor's information. He had failed, you know, miserably in, from various aspects of it, his agenda. But the other people who were going to fail very strongly were the black leadership. But the white leadership, Loretta Walsh and all of those folks, high marks, high marks. I mean, their community is very happy. They got everything they need, crossing guards, good policing. Oh, it's one. But only people I would have been, we would have been criticizing is the black folks. People who are in the second district, third district. And they're doing, they're try, some of them are trying to do good things. Some of them are not. But, but the point is, I didn't want to see us just beating up on our people. But, but you know what? They have decided. When I say they, I'm talking about the other race. They have decided we're going to push our agenda and keep them divided. It has to stop. Well, it, it has to stop. And, and I think that if it's done correctly, I mean, if you look at the struggle and, and you look at all the photos, even the March on Washington, um, there were people from all walks of life involved mm -hmm. yes. in the struggle. Absolutely. And that's what made it successful. Mm -hmm. um, and... <clears throat> If you go back to 2020 
and the cry for police reform, well, there were people from all walks of life mm -hmm. walking through this city calling for justice reform and <coughs> uh, police reform, rather. And when, when the uh, statue of, of Christopher Columbus was taken down, there was joy from people from all walks of life, especially young white people. Mm -hmm. And people were scared to death that they were going to go up in, into uh, the Highlands area and do, do this, that, and the third. But nobody uh, in, involved at that time, at that moment, was thinking about doing anything violent. It was all about <coughs> addressing the, the, the fluid situation and uh, addressing those things that remain present in our community that are signs of, of a wrongful and, and hurtful past. And it, it wasn't just black people, matter of fact, in my opinion, it wasn't primarily black people. Mm -hmm. um, there were people from goodwill all walks of life, and I think that's the road we need to be traveling down as, as opposed to being divisive as a community, as a people. I and mean, I just want to add on to that. When we did that protest in 2020, mm -hmm. we had the youngest, we had babies out there. Mm -hmm. And we had people in their 90s out there. Mm -hmm. So when you have one side putting out a narrative that we're going to be violent, I'm not going to let anything happen to kids. Absolutely. My little cousins were there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? So my primary objective, make sure everyone's safe, but make sure our message gets home so we can push for change, right? Push for that legislation. And that's what we have been trying to do for the last two years, right? But we're still dealing with some of the same pushback from within the Black Caucus, mm -hmm. especially with this policing reform, right? Mm -hmm. Like Jay said, there was people from every part of Delaware there. Mm -hmm. There was people who were Christians, who were Jewish, who were Muslim, who were atheists, mm -hmm. white, black, Hispanic, Asian, mm -hmm everything and they came together to say black lives matter right mm -hmm. because they understand that there's a systematic issue here mm -hmm. and that's what we have to come together on and right now it's said that some of the members of the black caucus aren't willing to do that right yeah, yeah because they moved out of the neighborhood because right. they moved out of the neighborhood they got their little education uh, they got uh, a, a well-paid good paying job got some political power and they forgot the struggle and that's what my Aunt Lil used to say. Be careful how you treat people when you're on your way up because you have to look at those same folks when you're on your way down. And what I'm thinking is happening as I'm listening to you is that a lot of, of what's happening is they've just forgotten the struggle. Mm -hmm. They've forgotten the purpose. But you've got, you've got to remember some people don't know anything about, about the well, or, or purpose. Or purpose. You're right. You're right. Because some people were born with the silver spoons and they were, they were born in different communities. And they don't want to, that's why I opened up by saying because I go to East Zion Fair doesn't make me a Christian. I mean, even, even with the, the demonstration. Um, and I told Kobe what I thought I also told Kobe I would support whatever they decided to do. But I'm done marching. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I was sitting up on the... the Whatever the, the little stage they had was with J.J., my, my son, while he was singing, I welcomed him in and kissed him goodbye because I'm done marching. Mm -hmm. I've done my fair share. By the same token, I thought it was an, important for me to be present mm -hmm. right. and do what I told this man I was going to do. And I said, I will support whatever you decide. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And look, when we're talking about this police reform, right, mm -hmm. and, you know, the, the story that came out earlier this week about the officer who's had multiple misconduct yes, great. offenses, yeah. um, Samuel Waters, the, the, the video that went viral, yes. the Wayne Brown's head being beat against bulletproof glass yeah. at the three C's right around the corner, mm -hmm. right? So we talk about things like that. Well, in 2020, in June of 2020, we asked to be able to see misconduct records. Right. Right? And it's not just for the public's benefit. It's for um, defense attorneys. It's, it's for attorneys have a strong, hard time getting, they get strong-armed mm -hmm. into not getting this information when it comes to police and reform, and that's an issue. Now, Delaware's Law Enforcement Bill of Rights, right, Leobard, I say it all the time, yeah. I think I've said it almost every show, <laughs> The statute is the worst in the entire nation when it comes to transparency, mm -hmm. right? It, it, it creates this secrecy around policing. Mm -hmm. Now, if you have someone who is a bad apple, right, mm -hmm. someone who has multiple complaints against them, what do you have to hide? 
Absolutely. Why not put that out there? And, wh mm -hmm. and why do good officers um, continue to fight against this particular police reform initiative and protect bad cops? I don't understand that. I think it's the well, bosses. I think it's the top people. I don't think there are cops. I've, I'm a son of one. There are cops who are very frustrated and upset with what is happening w within the police departments. However, it's those, those crooked people at the top who constantly make sure they grease the politicians' pockets. That's why all the black legislators need to be making sure that we get this Leoboard thing handled. And it just so right. happened one of our but, colored folks are, but, are a part of but, but leading as, that effort. If I have said repeatedly at county council meetings, and I'm making no friends and doing it, but I call them like I see them, for far too long, mm -hmm. the police have been running the government. Yes. And we have to make it so yeah. that the government runs the, runs the police. Yes. Well, that's the thing, right? And I, you, I want to use another example. You said, why aren't the good cops, right? Here's a perfect example. We talked about the 16-year-old girl who was dragged by the county right. cop, right? Absolutely. And then he got to retire because of Leah Board and everything mm -hmm. before anything was done to him. The officer who actually came out and made the report, mm -hmm. right? Because that officer who did the dragging mm -hmm. lied. Yes. Yes. He said there was no incident mm -hmm. in his use of force. You know, he had to just handcuff her and everything, but that was it. Other officer proved him wrong, had the video. They let it out, right? Mm -hmm. So who's getting pushback from internal, you know, other officers? Mm -hmm. The good officer. Right. Yeah. He's the one being harassed right now, not the one that committed a crime. So that's what creates issue internally for them. And that's why... Um, you know, and, and based off his reporting, mm -hmm. that's why we have an issue with them saying, well, we're going to do an eternal affair yeah. where it should be civilian oversight. But but here, now you, you got me started because mm -hmm. I have been screaming for the last two months for the release of that video footage. Mm -hmm. And when, when the police chief arbitrarily decides that because this officer, who we let retire, mm -hmm. full benefits, is, is being criminally charged, we're not releasing the video. Well, who the hell are you to make that decision by yourself in isolation? But see, and, if it and, was and a black it, guy... And why is it that I'm the only one that's speaking up about that on county council? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If it was a young black man mm -hmm. who did something in the community, mm -hmm. they would release the tape. Right even away. If they were criminally charging him for something. But let me carry one step further. Let a black officer... There you go. ...pull a white girl by the handcuffs and, and, and pull her by her hair... Pull our 50 feet, mm -hmm. you'd have got tired of looking at it by now. Right. But, but, but that's our issue. You know why it's our issue? Because we won't come together. The, the Leobor is being led, the whole commission piece, I don't understand all the language, is being led by an African American person. Mm -hmm. We had the person on the show. I'm being careful right now on purpose. For those of you who watch me, know normally I don't because I happen to like this legislator, but he needs to move. Because if he doesn't move, I'm going to start speaking up and start speaking out. Because that's why we got an opportunity right now to get this done. And it's not done. We would not have a situation where, where um, a police officer in another county in Maryland had, had, a, a, had some, some misconduct. And then after we fire him in Wilmington for throwing up one of our kids up against uh, one of our people up against uh, uh, the glass, if they would have had the right investigative stuff in front, we would not even had that issue. But see here, fire two times. But, but see here again, it goes to leadership, and all these things had transpired on the watch of this administration and this police chief. We don't have access to it, but who's responsible for the vetting? of the incoming officers in the police academy. But I think, didn't we say in Leobor you cannot, um, th their record didn't follow them? Right, so their record in Delaware does not follow them, right? What about Which the, is the in Maryland? In Maryland, it does. Oh, so they should have known about this they guy. They should have known, oh. but that's on the hiring and vetting process okay. has to be stronger okay. here. Not just in Wilmington, but all throughout right. the state, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. You need to be looking at implicit and explicit biases. You need to do, I mean, we are in the, the time of social media. In social media, a lot of people put a lot of stuff that they probably shouldn't on social media. Uh, Officer Waters had a lot of stuff like that on his social media page that dates back way before um, his time being hired here that if anyone would have looked at it, mm -hmm. I would have said, that's application. 
Well, if anyone would have looked at that alone, then seeing that the reason why he was fired, mm -hmm. the reason why he was fired down in um, Cecil County. Now, we all know about Cecil yeah. County. <laughs> he was in his private vehicle, mm -hmm. in his uniform, mm -hmm. sped through a stop sign. A lady tooted her horn because she had to right away. He gave her the middle finger. Mm -hmm. She followed him, followed a report. Mm -hmm. He was gone the next day. Mm -hmm. Well, I've got two questions for you. Mm -hmm. uh, the lady? Yes. African American, right? I have no clue. Well, well Probably I did. Not. I, no, no, I, no, she was not. Okay? Because if he would, she would have been chasing him, he would have thought that she was trying to kill him. But she, the white lady filed her complaint, and they did not tolerate it. Right? That's Cecil County. Which is the most racist place, right where KKK is. is got based. rid of him. Yeah, yeah. And Wilmington said, all right, come on over. <sighs> Unacceptable. Unacceptable. You know what? Let me, let, me, let, me, let me move a little bit further because the whole legislation piece, I'm upset with the Black Caucus. I'm upset with the fact that we have elected black people who are not representing us, who are allowing the agenda of the, the majority community to overwhelm us. I even watched well, how let they me, did... Let me argue with you. Okay, well, okay. go ahead. Go ahead. You've got one individual on this particular issue who happens to be a former police officer um, that, that you don't agree with. And... I don't agree with it either. By the same token, I think he's doing an outstanding job otherwise, and he's making a difference in, in the area of his district that... Uh, he's making a very positive difference in the area of his district that we happen to share. Mm -hmm. And he does a phenomenal job, in my opinion, mm -hmm. with constituent services. And right now, as we speak, <laughs> in conjunction with Senator Brown, they're doing everything they can to see to it that Rose Hill gets a brand new community now, center. But, Jay, and those kind since of you things, pushed it back at me, and, you know, I'm very respectful of you, I'm going to push back, too. I agree. The, the re representative we're speaking of, he is doing a very good job. Constituent Services, doing a great job. Anything I've asked him to do as a, or, or support on, he's made it happen. But this is life and death. You cannot tell me about how many times you sang on the choir after you've raped somebody. You cannot tell me how many cookies you baked. <laughs> Yeah, that's great. After this is a this is a dire issue. My people, look at look at what happened in Jersey. Now we're going to show this in a few minutes. But did you see how the police mentality is across the country? We 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 I don't care and, about and, and, how good you are with the constituents when my kids are being beat up by the cops. But I also want to say something here, right? He does have good constituent service on issues he cares about. Oh, right. So if you have over 300 people send letters to you, send emails, make phone calls, request that you meet with them either in person or virtually, and you just keep telling them no, that's your only response and communication back to them when it comes to talking about policing reform, mm -hmm. then that's, you're ignoring them because you don't want to hear what they have to say because you already have your mind made up. Now, well, there are that's, groups... That's just bad politics. Yeah, you, you have... The ACLU, you have Building People Power Campaign, you have Working Families Party, you have the Democratic Party, all canvassing, um, asking for people to support this effort they do and speak to your legislators. And when you're the one who is completely ignoring all these groups, all their efforts, mm -hmm. that's sad. And it is sad. And, and that, in, that includes who I don't always agree with, the Attorney General, uh, mm -hmm. who's been working on police reform. And... The, the driving force in the holdup is the FOP. Yeah, but 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 you you just said it is not the FOP running the government; it's the government running the FOP. That's how it should be, and that's how we need to make it. Because the reality of it is, the government is stronger than the FOP. The problem with us is that I'm not, and but I know Attorney General. Too long has been the FOP. Well, then that's then, then, well, then, well, I'm sorry. Then let me now, talk then about now that. The, then now the I want to make the, the the Speaker of the House. Said he should be arrested if something happened as a result of that demonstration. Mm -hmm. Now he's called for a peaceful demonstration. It so happened it was a peaceful demonstration, but the Speaker of the House said if something happened, he should be arrested. Well, but, but Donald Trump's walking around doing just what the hell he wants to do. <laughs>
Yeah, no, and look, Pete Swarkoff has his own issues. He's the Speaker of the House. Uh, under his leadership, he allowed all types of misconduct to go mm -hmm. untouched. Yeah. Under his leadership in the Speaker, um, as the Leader of the House, he's le allowed misconduct to go unchecked. Mm -hmm. But yet he called for my arrest. Mm -hmm. um, now, why does he have that same energy when it comes to holding those who have been proven to have mm -hmm. horrendous events and mm -hmm. incidents happen under their you know, power that we give them as a state, mm -hmm. have them held accountable to the same level he wanted me held accountable Because it's to. not what they're interested in, and that's all I want to say, and I want to make it very clear, and I'm going to be very clear. It's, we can disagree on issues. We can disagree on even methods. But what we cannot disagree on is to compromise the community upon which we have been voted upon to serve. I was e called upon, elected, to pastor Ezion Fair. I don't have time to be saying, well, I'm not this and I'm not that. The people trust me to serve them. Serve them when they're sick. Serve them when they're well. To serve their families. To, to, to go, there are things that theologically I disagree with. Preach, Pastor. But I have to be able to pastor all the people. Preach, Pastor. Now, I'm not trying to preach, but I'm just being honest with you. When you are elected, your agenda has to go to the side. And no one can give you a fish sandwich that is so good that you forget you really know how to fish. And we're back. Well, we've been talking about the Black Caucus. We've been talking about the Black Agenda. We're trying to make a way and find a way or a path to make sure that we begin to start coming together instead of being divided. Because 90% of what we talked about today had to do with the fact of our community leadership, our elected community leadership being divided. We can just look at the city council and see we're just divided. Go to the state. But now what we're hoping for is that we will become better and we start working together. Now, now, something happened this week uh, with the, um, uh, in New Jersey that really put crystal clear, really crystal clear how we're perceived by police, blacks and whites. Look at this. Accusations of racial bias by police after they broke up a fight between a pair of teenagers, one black, one white, at a New Jersey... Accusations of racial bias by police after they broke up a fight between a pair of teenagers, one black, one white, at a New Jersey mall. A now viral video shows the teens having a heated discussion. The white teen pointing his finger in the face of the black teen, who pushes the white teen's hand away. The white teen then shoves the black teen and the two begin to tussle. At one point, the white teen tackling the black teen and pinning him to a couch then throwing him to the ground. When police arrive to break up the fight, a female officer pulls the white teen away and pushes him to the couch without handcuffs. While the other officer presses the black teen to the ground and kneels on his back, the female officer also coming over to kneel on the teen's upper back while they place him, and only him, in handcuffs. Oh, no. Holy treatment some viewed as unequal, unfair, and racially biased. One bystander exclaiming in surprise as police handcuffed the black teen. Yo, it's because he's black. CNN affiliate WCBS spoke with one of the teens involved, 14-year-old Kai, who asked that his last name not be used. I was con like confused, like, well, why they saw me as a bad person, like, uh, me as a, like, aggressive. The eighth grader telling CNN affiliate WABC the fight began after he stood up for a friend a seventh grader, being picked on by the other teen, who the station identifies as a high school student. The teen calling the encounter with police scary and frustrating. If they don't know how to treat the situation and deal with the situation equally and fairly, then they shouldn't be able to deal with the situation at all. New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy saying, I'm deeply disturbed by what appears to be a racially disparate treatment in the video. We are uh, underscore with emphasis that we're committed to increasing the trust between law enforcement on the one hand and the communities they serve on the other. The NAACP New Jersey State Conference calling for the officers involved to be removed from the force pending an investigation and saying despite years of talk about bias training and accountability, when Bridgewater police found two youths fighting, the immediate reaction was to aggressively throw the black child to the ground. 
At the same time, the white youth was carefully eased onto a couch and treated like a victim. It's very obvious. Kai's mother, Ebene, telling WCBS. Maybe they could have broken up the fight and maybe set them aside and called their parents. No cuffs, no aggression. Dealt with them like they were teenagers. <laughs> Asked what they want to see happen to the officers. I guess for them to be fired. I'm not happy about it. And I do want those two cops to become unemployable. That's what I would like. If you're not disgusted, I don't know where you are. How could this be? I give the governor of New Jersey credit for at least speaking out against it. But how is it that the black gentleman, young bro bro brother... The boy is 14 years 14 old. years old. And he wasn't even pointing his finger in the guy's face. It was the white guy pointing in his face. He clocked him a couple times. But at the end of the day, how's, how's the white guy sitting nicely on the couch and the other one's being roughed up on the floor? Well, I mean... That's the way we as a people get treated more often than not by police. Um, and that's the way it's been ever since I can remember. And unfortunately, my better judgment tells me that's the, it'll be that way when I'm no longer here. It's fundamentally unfair. It's flat out rotten. And why would you as a grown man find it necessary to body slam that little boy like that anyway. I mean... Because he's a vicious criminal. He's a vicious... He, but he didn't start it. And it's a fight. The mere okay? fact that he's black but, but, makes but, him start it. You know, the, the, the fact of the matter is, I'm, as, as a past president of community youth workers and somebody who intervened in schools, I mean, basic fundamental training and breaking up a fight. If it's two of you, it's two people fighting, one take one, one take the other. Well, they did that. One took one and one took the other. They did that. Here's the thing. But I have never, in, in breaking up a fight, tried to body slam somebody to stop him from fighting. All you want him to do is stop. Not when you... But, but he wasn't asked to stop and he just body slammed and cuffed and then, and then she comes over. Now, what... You know, what could happen is while she came over to him... Right, the other one could have... The other could, yeah. came over and started fighting again. Yeah, well, we trust you just, Johnny. You, you we just trust Johnny. You, 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 you just don't... Fundamental training and breaking up fights, you don't do that. Yeah. So, you know, watching this video, right, mm -hmm. uh, you see the, the white teenager mm -hmm. pointing his finger in the young black guy's face, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. He said, get out of my face. They start fighting. To be honest, the black guy was losing the fight. He took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> he was losing them. He was underneath getting welled on. Yeah. But yet when the cops, and this all happened relatively quick, right? Yeah. The cops were right there and responded very fast, right? Mm -hmm. Good on them for that. They decided that the one who was getting beat up mm -hmm. was the danger one. Right. Threw him down, pit their knee on the back of his neck. I did see that. Yeah. And held him down and arrested him and let the other kid just sit there. That shows me one thing. Their training and their mind thought is black people are an inferior to white people. Mm -hmm. and the We're always the aggressors. We're the ones always in trouble, right? Mm -hmm. but it's no amount of training that can undo that thinking. That's called implicit bias at its uh, the best that you see it. That is implicit bias. But and it's on video. But this is a little kid. Um, and the whole thing with, with the knees and the, and the neck and the knees in the back to kill George Floyd, obviously, this police department is not taking that seriously. No. And, and you know, we're, we're right back to uh, where we started as far as I'm concerned. You know, they, they've learned this knee hole and, and right here in the city of Wilmington, um, a dog attack by police officers on a young man and these kind of things that haven't gotten reported that are going to get reported. Um, it's just outrageous. But we're bad people when we call for new leadership in the police department. And in my view, what's transpired under this police chief is unprecedented. Um, and the only thing worse, in my opinion, mm -hmm. um, was the execution of, of uh, Harry Smith Jr. in 2003, where his father took him to the hospital because he was hearing voices, and he was, he was able to get out of the hospital. They called the cops. The cop jumps out of the car, 
fundamental policing one on one. You exit the vehicle, you secure the vehicle. He jumped out of the car, left it running, and Harry Jr. jumped in the car and took off. They shot that boy 38 times mm -hmm. and left him laying in the middle of the street. Yeah. This this is this is really not this is this is just not good and and I disagree with you, Kobe. In the front end, he the, the black guy was taking it to him. It's just that he tackled him, you know. And then right. he start when the cops saw it. You're By right. the time the cops got there, right, yeah. the young black guy yeah. was never on his feet. By the time the cops right. got there, absolutely, he was actually on the ground when the officer just turned him over and threw him and down I and then slammed him. He was losing the fight. Well, no, 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 no. He, <laughs> he was losing the fight. Anyway, well, well, I, even though we this make a little why, just of it, the reality of it is it's a serious well, situation. Well, this is why but, we but, need but boxing he, he, in he, our he, community. He, ser yeah. he, he yeah. seriously yeah. Lost, the, lost the fight when the cop showed up. Yeah. And, and you got a grown man body slamming this little kid. But I it's not just the grown man. I got more of an issue with the woman, yes, cause right? Because here's the thing. She sat the little white boy down, tapped him on his shoulder, said, you good? <laughs> then went and put her knee on a black man's neck. Yeah. Then kid. got up. Kid. A black kid. Kid. Kid, yes. And then got up after they took the black boy ear, black kid away and went and checked and just hold, held her shoulder there. Didn't want to arrest him. This well, is what we're dealing with well, with I policing. Don't, I don't know if the video showed the whole thing or not, but did you notice how eloquent the little boy was and, and, and what he, in the interview afterwards... Oh, yeah. Yes. I did see that. Um, yeah, that's and, and, the video. And I was impressed. And, and the fact of the matter is, evidently, the person he was fighting was bothering somebody else, and he, he tried was, he to intervene. He was taking up for him. He was taking up mm -hmm. for another person. Yeah, that happened. Because that's what we do in our community. We're always trying to, to take care of the, the, smaller, the smaller person. That is true. One more thing I want to do, and we're going to go to a break, is that tw there are 21 inmates in Sussex County Prison, uh, that is institution, rather, who, who, are claim, who, have filed, who have filed a lawsuit... Uh, regarding their, the pattern of abuse that's there. We showed a video a couple weeks ago. Um, what's that all about? Well, I told you so. Oh. Okay, I told you so last week because I told you the only prison reform that has come forward has been the result of litigation. Yeah. And here again, you know, we, we were, at, as a state, once upon a time we had the highest rate of juvenile incarceration in the country Wow. The ACLU intervened, and now we don't have that situation. And I said last week, only litigation is going to help resolve these problems in the prison. And people go back, and you act as though the prison riot took place for no reason, okay? But when you abuse inmates inside, when... Their wives, their girlfriends, mothers come to visit them, and you abuse, <coughs> tongue lash, mistreat, and disrespect them. At some point, people get tired, and that's what happened when we ended up having the prison riot in the first place. And all the information that we've been receiving reflects the fact that we have ongoing accusations of mistreatment and retaliation as a result of, of, of the prison riot that, that took place um, five years ago now. Mm. You know, poor, poor Governor Carney got baptized by fire from the door because that happened. But even during the COVID crisis, um, I repeatedly questioned leadership in the Department of Corrections, the way things were being handled, um, and, and the allegations that we keep getting, um, which... I thought that the refusal to provide services, masks, and, and, and other protocols for the inmates was a continuation and continuity of the retaliation. And I think this litigation points to that in no uncertain terms. And in the Sussex situ situation, you've got inmates, black and white, mm -hmm. making these allegations. Mm -hmm. um, and. I think there's going to be some reform as a result of it. I think there's going to be some determinations, and I think some of those inmates are going to get checks. Mm. Well, see, here's the here's the whole situation, right? It started with two inmates. Now it's 21 inmates in this lawsuit, right, led by the ACLU, mm -hmm. um, and it's about the systematic pattern of abuse, mm -hmm. and they're focusing in on these last two years, 2020, 2021. So mm -hmm. under the pandemic, right, um, where you know everything's at a height, stress, and everything. Now. What they're saying is that these abuses are happening from 
they named 12 officers. They have a bunch of unnamed officers as well, too. Mm -hmm. These are current and former inmates down there. Mm -hmm. Now, I guarantee you, it's a lot more inmates who've been through a lot down there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But this is some of the same stories we heard mm -hmm. that came out mm -hmm. after the riot. Of what led to the what riot. What led actually. to the riot. That, and I think that's critical. Yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. So if they want to stop another riot from happening, mm -hmm. they better act quick. Okay. Right? Well, I hope somebody's listening. <laughs> right? Because here's the thing. And hopefully, you know, through this litigation, it eradicates um, this, this behavior, this practice, because now it's being brought to light. Mm -hmm. But we can't just let it be brought to light and then a year later turn the lights off. Absolutely not. Right? This keeps happening in Delaware, which means the system itself is continuing to fail. So what I think what Tr Street shared earlier is probably, not earlier, just a few minutes ago, is that the only way things get done in Delaware is through litigation. Mm -hmm. that's, but I gather, that's the unfortunate, I, harsh reality. But, but, but Jay, I, I'm not a betting man. I'm a praying man. But if I was the opposite, if I were you and you were me, <laughs> I'll tell you this. If the, black led, if the black caucus come together and deal with our agenda the appropriate way, litigation would not have to be an option. <coughs> well, I think litigation um, is, is a necessary option. And, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm reflecting on this whole conversation. Um, there have been major differences, in, 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 and you, you see the division on city council. Mm -hmm. But I think for the most part, mm -hmm. the legislative black caucus have worked together and, and at least have shown some semblance of working together um, and sh shown some great success. So I don't think it's all bad as, in particular as it relates to the legislative black caucus. Okay. Well, that's your opinion and I certainly support your opinion, but I'm here now. Show me, show, show, what have you done for me lately? And what, I, what I'm seeing now is not helping the people that I represent. I represent about 3,000 people. OK, and, and, and it's across the state and some out of the state as well. And I'm saying to you, and that's not including my Facebook and all of some folks. My, my, what I'm saying to you is that that there is too much division. It's too much things going on that should not be going on with elected officials. So we're going to leave it there. I'm going to let you say what you're going to say. But, but at the end of the day, yes, there have been some good. The good I've done, Shakespeare said, often succeeded me, but the bad stayed before me. So all that good is great, but just like an old wine head, some from the projects, what one of them old, old school, old head, wild heads that we used to have, they would talk about their glory days. How many women they had and how, much, how, many, how many points they could score on the board and can't even walk now. Don't talk about what you did. Tell me what you're doing. But I, I'm, I'm going to repeat. I think overall, over the last <coughs> session, Hmm. That they, they have done very well. Individuals and, have done very well, and I think they've done very well as a caucus because it, they 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 brought forward legislation as a caucus, and uh, even with the police reform, the 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 small win we got as as relates to changing the statute under under Title 11, 1164, 1165, 1167, is huge in in terms of the kind of reform that we need. Okay. We're going, we're going to continue this conversation. Uh, we'll be right back. And we're back. There's so much going on that we had. We, we, we don't want to miss the major point of our show, which is the Kobe Corner. So, Kobe, even in the midst of all that we've been talking about, let's see what's on Kobe's mind today. Yeah, so one of the big things um, that I want to talk about is the Wilmington Learning Collaborative. It's something that Governor Carney has proposed to really address some of the issues here in the city of Wilmington. This is going to be his flagship education um, project. Um, the three school boards who are involved with this, Christina, Brandywine, and Red Clay school boards, all unanimously voted to move forward with exploring um, what a MOU would look like for the Wilmington Learning Collaborative. Mm -hmm. So it gives the okay for their superintendents to go ahead and start working on this, working on it with key stakeholders um, and see how that, that structure is going to look. Mm -hmm. um, so over the next few weeks, you're, you're going to be hearing more about it. You're going to be hearing the discussions really ramp up. Um, I encourage you, if you, especially if you have kids in the school system, mm -hmm. um, to you know, make sure you're coming to these meetings, making sure you're reaching out, asking questions and figuring out what exactly is going to be happening. Um, there's also now a web page up on the governor's website that 
talks to what is the Women to Learning Collaborative as a Q&A up there, frequently asked questions. Um, but also, if you have additional questions, um, don't hesitate to reach out. Good. So next, I want to talk about something no, else. No, but I want to talk about uh -huh. that for just a minute, okay? <laughs> yeah. As I said, I'm not supporting it. Mm -hmm. I'm not opposing it. Mm -hmm. And my position was, is, and will be, them four districts need to be abolished. They should have never been created in the first place. It was against what all the experts said in 1978. We opposed the four districts being established in 1981. And for all the reasons that we opposed it in 1980, they're still relevant. And the, the best solution to, to, to the, the major problem that we have is you need one district. And why, 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 why in, in, in one county do you have six school districts? Mm -hmm. It's absurd. Right. 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 Yeah. So they're using a model from other uh, places like Denver, Colorado, Springfield, Massachusetts, Waco, Texas, to, to kind of shape this. And the, the three main components they're looking to look at the elements is the system, right? So community-based governing system, um, looking at wraparound services, mm -hmm. so extending learning and enrichment opportunities, behavioral and physical health services, and family and community engagement. And then the third is teaching and learning, so direct support to school leaders mm -hmm. um, to in, to um, initiate and kind of, you know, advance um, recruitment efforts, um, curriculum, and um, kind of the, the infrastructure support as well, too, for the schools. Okay. Um, so that's the good thing is purpose it's going go, it. to bring about more money. Yeah. Um, but the fact of the matter is our kids are in so much trouble. They need to take all that American Rescue Plan money and cut those classes in half. Okay, we, we, we had situations where the, the, the city elementary schools in, in the Christina School District, 0% to 10% of the kids meeting the standards, and now they're in high school. What are you going to do to make up for everything that's been missing since COVID was established? Right. As we speak, I know a teacher who is, is an early childhood education teacher, has 20 kids and, and a paraprofessional. 15 of those kids have IEPs. What, what are they, what are, are she and in, in, in the uh, paraprofessional supposed to be Houdini's? You can't, you can't have right. learning success with, with that kind of situation with these special needs kids. And, and you talked about the funding aspect. So it's a proposed additional $7 million will go into the Women to Learning Collaborative. Um, and that's for after school programs, pre-K seats, um, and additional staff, along with some administrative costs as well, too. Um, so but, they're looking to put more money into it. And then, of course, it'll be the funding from the districts as well, too. And, and right now, the reason I'm saying one district, you can't even get these districts to agree on the same calendar, the same schedule. When it snows, some open, some close, some two hours late. And you, I mean, it's just absurd to, to take a city and destroy it like that, cutting it into five different situations, five different uh, of, of, of ways of, of uh, teaching kids under five districts. And it, it's just outrageous. Absolutely. Yeah, so continuing on education, um, um, line here. Um, the Department of Education had its hearing um, uh, in the JFC. February is all JFC month, um, which means they um, for their FY23 budget is proposed to be $1.8 billion, um, which is a 5.9% increase over the last year's budget. Um, a lot of that money is going to be going directly into the classroom, trying to help um, kids kind of get over this this gap that's really formed and really expanded mm -hmm. since the pandemic. Um, academic services, looking at how they can have better mental health services um, and physical health services as well too in the school. Um, so the presentation was done by the new Secretary of Education, Mark Holliday, um, former superintendent of Brandywine. Then I'm going to talk about voting rights real quick. So while we're still discussing what's going on here in Delaware and what's going on in the nation, Milford said, we're not waiting for any of y'all. Um, Milford passed an ordinance making voting registration easier for residents. Um, I've talked about this before where there's two 
voter registrations for some municipalities here in the state. Um, Senator Lockman from Wilmington is actually working on a bill to address this. For residents who live in Milford, they have to register with the, the local municipality and with the state mm -hmm. to vote in our general election, but then also vote in their city elections. Mm -hmm. They want to do away with that and just have one process that stemlines it all, very similar to how Wilmington does. We have to register one time with the State Department of Election, and that's it. We can vote for governor, U.S. Senate, right. whatsoever, all the way down to city council. Um, now, outside of that, there's other municipalities that are still slow on the ball, that you have to register twice, and that disenfranchises a lot of people. So this will be, um, this will help shape um, what Senator Lockman's bill will look like and why it's so beneficial for people Great. throughout this state. Um, and again, like when it comes to that, it is important for us to remember that we, you know, as a state, we have the power to really empower, um, really empower the voters and empower them for their voices to be heard. So we have to do a better job at doing that. Um, and then lastly, I want to talk about the Department of Labor. The um, U.S. Department of Labor announces um, a new initiative um, to safeguard um, <coughs> workers' rights, especially for warehouse workers who've been on the front line of this pandemic. Um, so making sure that um, they all, all their pay is um, that they legally earn is protected both um, at the minimum of what they're supposed to be getting, but also their overtime pay. Mm -hmm. So they've seen what's happened during this pandemic. A lot of warehouse um, workers had to work overtime, but we're not being compensated for that. Um, and including, they're also going to be pushing for better um, safeguards and, and safer work um, places, making sure that the capacity is right, making sure um, workers are protected when they get injured and stuff like that. Um, and then also, um, they don't want people um, who take off to lose their jobs. They want to make sure they're protected under the Paid Family and Medical Leave Act. Um, so they're working to increase that as well, too, for um, warehouse workers. So if you work in a warehouse, there will be more information coming out. Reach out to the Department of Labor if you want to know your rights. Amen. Thank you. Thanks so much, brother. And I and I want to say that this we had to rush at the end. I really hate rushing yours. We may have to change your spot in, in the show <laughs> and put your stuff up earlier because I really appreciate what you do and your research and the, what you contribute to this team. Uh, Brother Jay, is there anything else on your agenda that you want to share with the people? No, my, my agenda, I told y'all last week, as soon as the weather breaks, the shooting was going to start. We had a murder yesterday. Yeah. Again, it's on the east side, not far from the police station. And who did it? Mm. Okay, and, and last year, and, and last week I talked about 39 murders. The News Journal makes it clear that it was 41 murders. Um, you know where the hot spots are and you're not doing anything about it. And the worst example I can give you is 1200 block of West 2nd Street. They were in that block doing everything they wanted to do. Housing Authority bought properties. They tore them all down. So the people who were doing what they were doing in 1200 block, mm -hmm. they're now in the 1100 block. Mm -hmm. And it's the same old mess. Um, and, you know, I hope next week we, we can have some time to talk about since nobody wants to write a plan, nobody wants to talk about a plan, the things that should go in a plan to reduce and stop this violence. Because it's not rocket science work, and it, it takes a team um, in an entire village, and um, a lot of it set forth in the whole commission plan, but, but things like um, putting people in the street to work, the mental health specialists, the social workers, the interventionists, um, you gotta have informant money, who's working, social media, do we have people identified with that? Do we have enough lighting? Yeah. Okay, well, and, and, and the partnerships that are necessary to stop all this foolishness, including a lot of people that want to use guns and shoot and all that, um, they need to be in jail, or we, as some of the veterans say, you know, they want to shoot, then let them go to Iraq, Afghanistan, or now Ukraine somewhere, and shoot, they can do all the shooting they want, but they don't need to be on the street. All right, and what we'll do is I'm going to take you up on that, and you'll be back next week, and we, maybe we do need to talk about it so we, when we have time because we're out of time today. Anything else on your agenda? No. Uh, 27 years ago today, I was born. Oh! So I'll be celebrating my birthday. Happy uh, birthday to you. <laughs>
<laughs> um, but, you know, everyone have a very nice week. Um, enjoy the holiday yeah. uh, day off for President's Day um, and continue to be masked up and continue to get vaccinated. Thank you. And happy birthday, um, uh, Kobe. I did, I did not know that, but great, great, great. You're 27 years old. I remember when I was 27. But <laughs> I, I don't remember that far back. Yeah, further back. <laughs> I want to take this opportunity to thank every last one of you for the time we shared together. It's just not enough time. At some point, Dennis is going to give you some free time where I can go two hours. I'm going to say that again. Dennis <laughs> is going to give me some free time so I can go two hours so we can get all this stuff covered because at the end of the day, it's a whole lot we do want to discuss and make sure that you are cognizant of. This is Dr. Curry. This is Kobe Owens. Jay Street. See ya. Take care, y'all.